let's go ahead and deal with objection number one, which is women can be pastors because Galatians 3 says that we're no longer male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, but we are one in Christ Jesus. So you see, I put the objection up so you can see it and kind of take it all in. That is objection number one. Now, the reason why you're going to run into problems with that is because the context of Galatians 3 is about justification by faith. If you don't believe me, I'd like to help you out. If you were interested in studying the book of Galatians, I have this study available at the standardhomeandliving.com lifestyle store. There you can save 30% off this wonderful resource to guide your understanding, right? So it's a study on Galatians. I don't know if y'all, this camera, that camera, whatever camera, I don't know what's happening. But um, that is, that's a study that's going to kind of help reorient your thinking. And I'll get into a little bit as to why people tend to run to that scripture. Um, but we're going to dig into it. So the context of Galatians, like I said, of Galatians 3, or the whole book for that matter, is about justification um, by faith. And before Paul talks about us being one in Christ Jesus, he spends a great deal of time talking about the law, right? He teaches how the law was our tutor and that those who were under the law before faith came were justified by faith that would later be revealed. Now, all of us are, if you're born from above, are one in Christ Jesus, right? And we're one in Christ and we're one, we're reconciled to one another. But the issue that the Galatian church was dealing with, with the Jews, was that the Jews wanted the Galatians to believe in the gospel and keep the law. And it was, it was like the gospel plus. And Paul wrote this letter to just squash the foolishness. He was like, listen, before the resurrection of Christ, you know, Paul is telling the Gentiles that they were enslaved, but now they are no longer a slave. And not just the Gentiles, but also the Jews too. Both were enslaved and both who are in Christ have been set free. And the Gentiles were in pagan bondage, and their attempt to live as a Jew, that whole idea is sub-Christian, and it's literally another form of bondage. This is why we have issues with the Hebrew Israelite movement, the black Hebrew Israelite. Um, they literally want the gospel and, and it's literally a, another form of bondage. Their commitment to the law is demonic. I didn't say the law is demonic. Do not misrepresent or hear me say something that I didn't say. Their commitment to the law in terms of looking to it to justify them and make them righteous, that's what's demonic. We cannot turn back the clock of redemptive history. So Galatians 3.28, it doesn't say that because of our position in Christ with relationship to one another um, and is one of equality, that we should abandon our gender distinctions in the home or in the church. This verse, when flowing in the context of the broader passage and the entire book, actually is saying that the things that do distinguish us do not imply that we are spiritually unequal before God. Although we are spiritually equal, that is the Jew and the Greek, that's an ethnic difference. Then you have the slave person and the free person. That's a societal and a social difference. And then the male and the female, that's a biological and ontological difference. But we cannot take our spiritual equality in Christ and then use that to usurp the established order of the church. Our spiritual equality as it relates to being reconciled to God and therefore to each other it is not synonymous with the God-ordained roles of headship and submission in church, society, and the home, i.e. the family. Now, we see within the Godhead, between the Father and the Son, 
before the world began, but in the, um, we saw an equality there. But in the incarnation, Jesus took on the form of a servant and he submitted himself to the will of the Father as an example for us. And because Christ died in our place as a righteous substitute, the only way for him to live the life that we cannot live is for him to submit to the will of the Father, his authority, like the perfect life that we cannot and could not live due to our sin. And in this, Jesus fulfilled all righteousness. So when men or women run to Galatians 3, they are not handling the text with skill. Why? Because it is reckless and biblically irresponsible to use Galatians 3 as a proof text in order to substantiate a position that is already explicitly forbidden in Scripture, right? Let me mention this. This is why topical preaching is less than favorable, and oftentimes it will stunt the growth of a believer. What do I mean by that? I'm not saying that topical preaching is bad, but what I am saying is that over time, in over reliance on topical preaching, it will weaken the understanding and the, I like to call it the comprehension muscles of the church, because. You, if you've listened to a lot of topical preaching, right, you're simply just not used to studying an entire book of the Bible in a clear expositional fashion, right? So, for example, if you're in Joshua on the first Sunday and then the book of Luke on the second Sunday and then First John on the third Sunday and then you in Romans on the fourth Sunday, your church will eventually develop the bad habit of making scriptures say what they wanted to say rather than what the authors were attempting to convey. Like, you you can't take, or should I say, you cannot read a book, right? You can't read or study the entire book of Galatians and then walk away confident that the Lord has given you marching orders for you to go and pastor a church, right? Like, nothing in the letter would even lead you to believe that pastoral leadership or church polity was on Paul's mind when he wrote the book of Galatians. Galatians was written to demonstrate that Christ versus the law. Paul was admonishing the Galatian church to commit to Jesus, not the Mosaic law, right? We, we, when you fail to understand that, what ends up happening is if you try to commit to the law, you're going to suffer division and disaster. And if we miss the macro, you're going to misunderstand the micro context. It's honestly, you guys, it's really just bad hermeneutics to run to Galatians to prove that women can be pastors. Um, and so hopefully I've given you a nice broad overview of why to insert, you know, Galatians 3.28 to make it somehow mean that it gives us ladies license to pastor. It just doesn't even fit in the context. If you have studied, I can help. I'm here to help, like the government. If you just study the book of Galatians, you there's no, you just be like, how did, how did we figure, how did we try to use that text to bolster that point?